Welcome back to Beyond the Futsal podcast. Uh, we're glad to be back. It's been a few weeks, and today is actually Mother's Day, so I guess it's a Mother's Day type of special. It's one um, of those. <laughs> I'm Zonia Junta from Swami Chronicles, and we got Sabrina from Observing Spooks, and we'll give all that info at the end, but welcome back to the podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about a very uh, interesting and special place. It's a, especially special for you, I think. Yeah, it is. So I think we should, we should discuss um, something about uh, this place we're going to discuss. That just happened, what, a weekend ago? Yeah, yeah definitely. So we're going to talk about the General Hospital and the Boyle Ooh. Heights Historic Campus. I mean, I came up with that name right now. <laughs> um, yes, it's actually today called LAC USC County Hospital, but I like the old school name, General Hospital. And it's a special treat to talk about it because um, last week I did join um, one of the Art Deco Society's events where they gathered a a few, you know, Instagram people that, you know, take photos of different art tech, art deco architecture and whatnot. And I got an opportunity to participate in that. And one of the choices that I made for my presentation was the general hospital Uh, out of maybe, I think I had, I chose five buildings, but one of one of them was that even though it, it's it's a known place, but it has a lot to talk about. We have it a does. podcast to talk about the place. We do. This month is the month of May Preservation Month. So any of these old buildings, it's it's kind of a special time to you know highlight preservation of these old buildings, not just our deco, but across the board, different buildings. So the the Art Deco Society was highlighting um, the different Art Deco buildings in LA. So, and then they're doing a bunch of different things with Art Deco challenges and whatnot. But I, we didn't want to talk about this particular area because it has a lot more than just the general hospital. It does. It's like its own little city within a city. It really is. So the the campus the boundaries around the campus are Marengo Street, so that's kind of like the the main part, the main street to the front of the new hospital. And we'll explain all that because it, there is now a develop, you know, over the years. And then it's San Fernando, um, sorry, Valley Boule- Valley Bur- Boulevard, Mission Road, and then there's like streets inside of the campus which is Zonal Street and East Lake Street. There's probably a few other ones, but those are like the ones that stand out. Definitely. Yes. Yeah, so it's in the city of Boyle Heights, borderline Lincoln Heights, because right there around the area, we're going to talk about everything that's there. So the General Hospital, the Women and Children's Hospital, which recently got torn down, but we're, we'll get to that the coroner's office, Central Juvenile Hall, the new hospital, basically the USC campus overall, which has a ton of different buildings. And then across the street is Lincoln Park. And Hazard Park is on the other side by Soto Street. So that's Hazard Park, which is another historic park. They're all pretty historic parks. Yeah, and the whole episode within itself yeah so yeah that's kind of how uh we want to talk about this building this the building but the just the surrounding area because it has a lot you know of history in it so i mean we could just start off with um what do you think the history of the hospital first and we'll kind of just go from there sounds good to me how many of you all like art deco raise your hand <laughs> everybody <Me. laughs> So just to give like a, a, a brief on the history of the hospital, it was pretty much built between 1927 and 1933. 
And it was right after the Great Depression, actually. So the Great Depression ended earlier in 33, and the hospital was finished December of 1933. So as you see, there was a lot going on right before it and the care for people was probably much needed. I would say that there was probably a mass exodus to California from other Eastern states that were much more developed and suffering greatly from the, the Great Depression, which probably would add to the boom in California and hence the need to um, make such a large hospital for the new population or the ever-growing population. Yeah, so what they decided to do was there was already a hospital there, an old hospital, where the coroner's office is now, which was built in the early 19, I think, yeah, early 1900s. But there was already other buildings there that were part of the old, old hospital. They basically had a, there was already something there. I mean, it, it wasn't like they just built the hospital. There was already other parts of the hospital there, the old parts, which now, some of the buildings have probably gone over the years, but the one that still stands out right now is the coroner's office. Yes. Which I believe was the, one of the original hospitals. I'm sure they had other little buildings around it. Beautiful building. Yeah, it's a Victorian style brick. We got to go inside one time. That was fun. It was when it used to have a gift shop. <laughs> so gimmicky. I don't know why they took it out. I don't know. Everyone likes gimmicky stuff especially tourists. Yeah, so it was built in 27, but because of the earthquake and Long Beach earthquake in 33, they kind of had to kind of restart it and they retrofitted it to be earthquake safe, which meant they had to make it out of steel, cement, and like kind of have it on a bedrock. Mm -hmm. So if you notice, it's kind of elevated. Yes. And that's the part that makes it really interesting, how it's elevated. So the hospital boasted of 19 stories, 800 beds. It was a teaching hospital with its own theater. And it's always been used, uh, linked to USC. Yeah. So the theater, she's talking about the amphitheater. It's a surgical amphitheater that they used to teach students how to perform surgery. It's hard to explain it. You have to see it to kind of see how amazingly creative that was to add that to the building. If you've ever seen any old Victorian movie and especially anything like Frankenstein, they show in England these kinds of amphitheaters or theaters of surgery as well. So it it's like that, but on a much grander scale. It's huge. Yeah, and it's super steep. Like steep as can be. So odd. Yeah, you don't want to fall down off that. <laughs> What what was happening during the time, they hired allied architects to do the project and um, like a thousand other contractors, but the budget kept going up and up and down and they had to like cheap out on a lot of material at the end because the, it was just going, the budget was too high. It went from 11 million then to 16 and then they had to lower it down. So they had a, they did have to cheapen on some materials. So it probably would have been more grand if they would have kept what they originally wanted. And some imagine? of the examples is like linoleum floor. They probably would have had like tile floor or something. Definitely. Or something way more beautiful. But they had to go cheap route and they went for linoleum, at least in the rest of the buildings. And then uh, the, instead of uh, marble, they had to do painted steel, like in the bathrooms. I don't know if you guys have been in old bathrooms that have marble dividers for the stalls. Um, very sturdy and beautiful, but it's probably really expensive. So they had to go for steel painted stalls. So they did have to cut back a little bit on, on some of that. So one thing that we did, we both uh, seen was the Hugh Hauser episode. So tell me your thoughts about that episode. Because he went in there in 2008 or 2010 and We'll talk about kind of like the early history and then get back to the the, the present, but I, I do want to talk about that episode. Well, to give context, we've, you and I have both been into the hospital and around it um, multiple times. Uh, so we've seen what we've seen for ourselves. 
and we'll get further into that later on in the conversation. I just want to put that in context because I've never fully explored the entire hospital. And Hillhauser um, was able to. And there's things in there that I didn't even realize were in there. For instance, silly old me, I never knew on the 13th floor that it served as a jail. That's pretty crazy. They had a whole floor dedicated to to oh, a jail. 13, huh? Because 13 is an unlucky number. A lot of people skip over 13s, like in buildings and stuff like that. It's it's always been, you know, unlucky. So I assume they were like, fuck it. Let's just make it the jail. They're already unlucky. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, that was a great episode where him just asked, exploring that. Yeah, he, he interrupts a lot. But beyond that, he he does that like you, we uh spoke about earlier he asks great questions and he kind of gets to the bottom of things um yeah also i didn't know how deep and far the tunnels went and seeing them in there it just it it was perspective can you imagine walking down there like at nighttime and being stuck halfway and hearing eerie noises and not knowing where to go and what to do yeah, the tunnels are great, and we'll definitely talk about our experience going in the tunnel. <laughs> but what I like about the episode, and we did go in there ourselves, but he he does describe the front facade very well. And you mentioned your take on the statues in the front. Well, we were talking about getting into the supernatural. We have Art Deco. We have all these different... Um, people, important people in scientific history um, for medicine specifically. And Hillhauser describes in the very front of of the hospital, there's the angel of mercy. Mm-hmm. And um, you'll see uh, if, when you look at, if you look at pictures or if you're ever able somehow to get inside that there's all kinds of little shrines. Um, I feel that that gives a supernatural um we play into that supernatural feel you look at the front you see the statues and they represent like the city of angels and the angels to help you know the the poor and vulnerable because and you know the the hospital was meant to be open to everybody it was welcoming everybody in the community because again back in the 30s not there was not the private insurance and the private hospitals. And it was basically come here. We're going to help you. We don't care who you are, the vulnerable, all that. So those, those statues represent um, the the angels, city of angels. And then you go in there and there's like a pre front lobby. I don't It's probably called something. And that one has other statues in there. And there's like murals on the ceiling with medical, like it's like a medical jargon. Well, it's it's a beautiful like kind of a poetic type of scripture that's related to the me- medicine on the ceiling, and then there's these two entrances I believe with like beautiful wrought iron and like glass, and then you go once you cross that you go into the main lobby, the reception area, which has the terracotta floors. So those floors they did spend money on. It's not linoleum; it's more terracotta floors these really high ceilings with black marble columns, which they probably saved some of the, they did keep a little bit of mar, a little bit of marble. Um, it probably would have been more. And then they, um, they have like photos of the original when the building was going up in black and white in the lobby. And then in, they have like a clo- in, enclosed reception area like it's probably made out of wood or something where people would check in. Um, I don't know. I, I thought I seen some old signage in the reception area, but, yeah. and then like the kind of like the dim lighting, um, highlighting certain walls. So I, I hate that I, dim lighting. You what? I hate the dim lighting, that buttery light. <laughs> I like it when it just has like certain corners lit and stuff. But, you know, at the time, um, he went win in 2010. We went in... Uh, no. Probably around that time the first time. 
He went in, um, no, he went in way earlier. Sorry, he went in about 2008 or something. We went in 2010. I went a few times, but I didn't, I took pictures, but I didn't take enough pictures of the lobby. I don't know why. It's quite so, overwhelming when you see it in person. So this front part here, see the, on the right, you see the, the lobby that I'm talking about. See the lighting here? I like this type of lighting. It more than likely like, it was. Very dim. And then and then some of the outside details right here, the wrought iron, the roads going up to the emergency room. I mean, I love the the million steps to go up. That those are some of the higher floors. It sits. I remember this talking about this this morning. The way it sits when you look from the front, it reminds me of one of the Sphinx in a pyramid in Egypt. The way it sits on its hill, it stands on top and it kind of so know, like a beacon. About the, these statues right here? No, I'm talking about the whole thing. Like, look at oh, okay. where it says the wellness center right there. Yes. Think of that as the pause. Yes. And the body and then the top part, the upper top part is like the head. It just, there's something about the way it's shaped that it's always reminded me of like a sphinx uh, or a pyramid in, in Egypt. Yeah. And I really love like all these stairs, probably really difficult for people that have broken limbs. Or that are lazy and out of shape, like people I may know. Yeah. We don't know anybody like that. So. Yeah. <laughs> But, so I don't know how they did it before. There must have been some kind of, like, elevator or something. I don't know. Hopefully there was. I think there, there was some elevator technology. Like, I don't know right away. You know, obviously there's 19 floors. They need to get up and down somewhere. So there, there should have been. There's obviously some kind of elevator system. They might have upgraded it through the time. So this is just kind of a... a an example of that. And we're into the audience that's only hearing the audio. I'm showing some of the photos here. So if you do see it on YouTube, you could kind of see it better. But anyhow, yeah, so that the heel episode was great because he got to go in behind the scenes and and get it like a tour of, you know, all the nooks and crannies of the building. I found really interesting the um of uh, the area where they kept the bodies and the, the little morgue. Yeah. well the morgue but the little theater part where it had the curtains where they could view the bodies I oh, found that yeah. pretty interesting yeah I I remember I think with the coroner's office used to do that where they would put the body behind the glass and the family would come and identify it or you know spend some last moments with it which I think now we kind of do it a different way I'm not sure they do that similar things like that anymore but or when they're examining it so yeah that's interesting how they have that yeah the one thing that well there's things that I oppose to this um, building but one thing that I'm really un, un, am unha unhappy about with this building is the lack of uh, air conditioning I think I would have died if I was a patient back in the 40s and having to sit there in the ward and being hot that would be so yeah annoying. i think they did add it later on i'm not sure how many years later they did have to add the ac system but i think initially it wasn't it wasn't there they would use uh buckets of ice and they would have a fan in front of it to fan the patient the nurse <laughs> the on the heel hauser episode was talking about how many times uh, patients would uh, get dehydrated and then have to administer IV fluids to an otherwise, you know, fine patient, except the dehydration with the, the heat. And that would have been me. I would have been there with like X's in my eyes, like, Bleh. So it finally opened in 1933. And some of the first patients were there with the women in the, the maternity ward was the first ward that was open. And they we're moving in all these women pretty quickly. And, you know, I did find out that the, the, the lady who gave the first birth in mm -hmm. the hospital, her name was Loretta Mangles. 
and she had a baby girl. She was moved from an, one of the old wards, wherever that was on the grounds. When you know, again, there were still other hospital buildings there before, but yeah. this was like a big deal. There, she was moved to that ward. I think shortly after, there is they they kept you know records of all the moms giving birth and all that. Um, so at one point, there was about three thousand six hundred patients. That's a lot. That's a so, lot. If there was 800 beds initially, they must have just added more and more. That's wild to me to think of that. But one thing I thought was interesting was where they would would take them to the roof of the hospital so they could get sunshine. Mm, so I guess the roof the was vitamin like, C. Yeah, the roof was accessible for... Imagine all these hospital beds out there. Ooh. That sounds kind of, I don't know, a recipe for disaster. Kind of. It's just, I don't know. Speak, like, obviously, well, they didn't have HIPAA back then, but all these beds and all these people, like, yeah, I mean, I don't know. It seems, but I kind of like the idea. Like, let me take you guys to the roof. Oh, uh, well, so that roof was important. They did mention the ward, the the rooms were like what twenty or twelve people to a room, easily, and like at capacity would be like twenty one, and that's tops. It's a lot of people in one room. So and like, it's something, yeah, yeah, nothing like what like we know now. I'm sorry. Sorry, like a dorm setting. Kind of, yeah, yeah. They call them wards, but I I can't imagine in medicine today that we practice right. I don't know the last time you've been to the hospital, but you probably didn't have to share your room with more than like four people or three people tops. And I'm only speaking on like my son's behalf. He was in the hospital not too long ago and he was admitted and he had three other, you know, potentially three other roommates, no more than four to a room. Can you imagine like triple or quadruple of that? That's a lot of people. Uh, I mean, and a lot of germs, like private rooms, at least yeah. now with Kaiser. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah i i think I, you know i i guess in old movies and stuff they show like you know the the rooms with a bunch of people in it so i could see that because we don't ever think about places like kitchens who thinks about a kitchen and how much food they're com you know continuously outputting the entire day and you can imagine well if you're not a nurse or you don't work in the medical field every single person usually has some sort of like a diet. Even if you think of a diet out here, it's different than like in medical jargon, right? The diet is just basically what you can eat and especially depending on what you're in the hospital for, what you're allowed to eat. So can you imagine how many people in that hospital that these uh, cooks would have to supply meals for at least three times a day? Well, did you see when Hill went to the kitchen? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> it was like a humongous kitchen <laughs> with like all sure. these like ovens and stuff yeah you would so, need that and I think he said or the doctor that was you know showing him around said that there would have been a staff of like 300 plus for just the, in kitchen. the kitchen only the whole just hospital the was over 5,000 people yes working. Yes, definitely. And you know, a lot of those are, are like the cooks, unsung heroes, like the janitors who made sure that things like blood and guts, like literally, and shit and urine and things that we don't like to see or talk about. And they are the ones that had to pick that up. That's a yeah, lot of stuff. So it was it was very massive and a lot going on there. Very different than what it is now, right? Definitely. So so that, that kept going, and over time, they, you know, started uh, still remodeling and taking away, you know, adding more buildings to it. So in 1958, 59, so where the Children and Women's Hospital of that that you know of, it used to be the orthopedic hospital. Mm. And then they changed it to the women and children's hospital in about 59 and they added a bunch of different other buildings there was a lot of births going on at the time so they needed a, a whole hospital in itself just for the women and children yep they sure did so that was interesting how that that played out um 
And then they also had a, a nursing school built later on. Um, oh yeah, just to go back to the birth, in 1952, there was about 10,000 babies born that year. Just at the wow. Hospital. And 250 acute patients admitted daily. And wow. about 61 buildings around total during that time. Again, 5,000 employees. Um, the residents in the 50s, the doctor residents, they only got paid $75 a month, which is not much at all. Nothing. They, they did require them to live on campus. But in the early days, they, they didn't get paid at all. It was like kind of volunteer basis, like because they were in school. Yeah. <laughs> like an internship, you know, yeah, paid like, internships whoa. are something that are much more modern now, but you used to intern and it was a free internship. Like that's where you learn your skills and proved your worth and so forth. Yeah. I don't think doctors would intern for free now. No. <laughs> no. Other, other careers still do, you know, for free, but back in the days they did not And then they started getting stipends and whatnot. So they had, uh, when that, that Women and Children's Hospital was built, the residence hall or, you know, building was also built so that residents that worked in the hospital would live on campus. Because remember, there's still, USC is still part of this whole equation because... The entire time? Yes, it's part of the school. I don't know when it officially, like, became, like, a campus, like, USC campus, but... It always been linked to the county hospital. And it's always good to have, you know, uh, a, a hospital, county hospital or any hospital in particular, that's a learning hospital because it's going to be state of the art and you're going to have competent doctors and, and medical um, personnel coming out of that place that are ready to go out into the world wherever they may go or stay. And they ha will have been exposed to so much more as opposed to a little dare I say, mom and pop hospital or something that's much more smaller scale. Right. So just to kind of clarify, so USC has obviously a medical program, various medical degrees. And if you go to med school, medical school at USC, you're obviously going to do some of the work while you're in school at the hospital. But when you graduate from medical school, you still have to apply for residency somewhere. So it could be anywhere in the country. So they don't necessarily have to stay at USC. They could apply anywhere else. And other people from other states come to work as residents at the hospital. So they might have gone to school somewhere else, but they, they do the residency at, at the hospital. Does that make no, sense? I know that. Um, just for clarification uh, sake, uh, I mean like any person coming on, not necessarily USC. I'm saying the program USC. I'm saying that anyone who came on as, as a resident, uh, a doctor as a you know a, a nurse in training or or a respiratory technician or whatever their medical personnel background may be they learned a lot more there a lot more skills that they wouldn't necessarily have been exposed to at like a smaller hospital yeah so it is very important places so these doctors future doc i mean there are doctors so yeah when they finish a residency you know those are the it doesn't mean that they're any less, they're doing, you know, good work, but the residents could come from anywhere and not have to attend USC, but they're working at USC once they get to that point. But when you're in school, you're still in medical school working there. It's kind of a weird thing. And I didn't really know until I kind of like, oh, okay, it makes sense now how that, that works, right? When I was in nursing school, I did an internship there. And I remember them telling us at the end of our internship that if we wanted to join the RN bridge program, um, that they would pay for our schooling if we signed contract with them for three years. Yeah, yeah, that's I, I I've seen the the nursing school, which later that nursing school that that we see now wasn't the one originally built in the '60s. The one originally built in the '60s is not there. I don't know why the other one came up later, but that's what I read that there was a different one, and then that one I see across the street, which we'll describe kind of the other buildings as well. So, yeah, so that's kind of that part of the history. Um, it's It's been through a lot. I mean, after the 60s and the 70s, there was a, a big controversy with, at the Women and Children's Hospital, when they were sterilizing 
Mexican women without consent. And it was a very, very, you know, wow. Like when I found out about that, I was like taken back. Like, that's horrible. I didn't know that in the 70s they were practicing eugenics. But now that I'm looking into all that, they've been doing this low key for many years. I mean, not just right here, all over the, the country. I mean, Native women, African-American women, Mexican women. It's it's pretty sad, but it's even more sad when you find out somewhere that you admire some, so much, so close to home, and it was, you know, a hotbed of tr- controversy for the same reason. And during that time, well, I found out about it because there was a documentary called No Mas Bebes, and it highlighted 10 Mexican women from, you know, the Boyle Heights, East LA area that were having their babies there in the 70s. And many of them had, you know, kids already, and maybe one or a couple had, you know, their first child, but many of them had a couple of children. There was one lady actually didn't have any, but they had them sign consent, like when they were like all zoned out. And what do you know about um, sterilization? I don't know, you know more about what they do. Like they actually cut tubes and stuff, right? Well, I, I did. I, I did not watch the documentary, so I can't really, you know, speak for what it said. It was a tubal litigate, lit- litigation, or something like that. A tubal ligation. Okay. Yeah. Did they did they describe it also with cauterization? I believe so, because it wasn't reversible. Yeah. Well, when you do the uh, tubal ligation, it's your tubes are being tied, and when you cauterize the tubes, that means you take the two ends of the tubes and you, like, um, you cause a fissure with heat you fire you burn them so therefore like if you reattach them because there's going to be scar tissue the likelihood of semen going to the tubes to attach to an egg is going to be very very small i have a tubal ligation i just wanted you guys all to know i have a tubal ligation as well but i opted for that exposure (laughs) yeah (laughs) yes i guess but it, it is, it's permanent because at one point I was considering, you know, maybe having a child with my ex-husband. Thank God that I couldn't. But um, once you get that done, it's, it's pretty much you have to have surgery to attempt to reattach it. And there's no guarantee because that scar tissue is going to be the key to keeping you from getting pregnant and the barrier from keeping you from ever getting pregnant again. So what was happening is that there was discrimination against these women because they were saying, well, they're having too many kids and they're going to be on the system, you know, the welfare system. They don't know, you know, they don't work. Um, They're just going to be taking up all these resources and it's probably better if they don't have more kids. So they took it upon themselves and they still didn't, you know, they deny it to the well, I guess to them. No, actually, they I did apologize, but it's still messed up. Um, they did the, the reason it came out was because there was a lawsuit, and that's the only reason. And they actually lost the lawsuit. Thirty years later, the county finally apologized, which is sad. But they they did lose a lawsuit. But that's kind of what highlighted everything with the lawsuit. Yes, and I'm sure there there might have been a, a a language barrier, like for instance, they're telling them to sign this paper and it may not be in their you know origin their language of origin and like you said all like doped up from medicaid you know medical procedures something and so they can't probably make that consent you know yeah Um, and so that's some really shady shit yes it was during c-section so cesarean emergency surgeries and that's why they were able to get in there because it was usually during those labors Yep, which makes absolute sense. And at that time, they didn't have any consent paperwork in Spanish. So the only thing that did come out of the lawsuit is they did change the paperwork to be bilingual. But other than that, they lost. And the reason that they, a lot of women didn't want to come forward because, you know, immigration reasons, um, intimidation. Of course. course. Like you said. So it was just really sad. I I recommend you watch that movie, No Mas Bebes. Really I've heard a bit. Happened. I've heard of it, but I just haven't taken an opportunity. You yeah, know me. You know, if you guys are interested, watch that movie. It's really impactful. So 
Yeah, so we're kind of kind of going on um, some of the points here. Like there, there was that that happened in the 70s. And then in the 80s, there was a, a big health crisis where they had to shut down a bunch of emergency rooms. I guess there was a lot of funding, defunding, and there's like no budget. All kinds of like financial issues going on statewide probably. Yeah. And a lot of people would go to these private hospitals for emergency care and they can't pay it because you know they don't have medical or none of that either yeah they don't have any private insurance and it was like a burden of like people of not people but like that people weren't able to pay their bill but then at the end it trickled down to the it, all these like, calls for emergency rooms so they were saying that they were gonna shut down some of these emergency rooms i don't know that ever actually went through but that's one of the things they were looking at in the 80s that happened in mental health as well. Yeah, yeah, uh, closing of hospitals and whatnot. So yeah. it might have been part of that. Can you imagine, and I don't want to take this too far off subject, but can you imagine like whole state-run facilities? We're talking about lockdown facilities. All of a sudden, just let go of their you know, patients, mental health patients, and they just are let go. Can you guys even imagine? So in the smaller scale or maybe not so smaller scale, as we compare it to um, County USC, to the hospital, to General Hospital, um, can you imagine how many patients were not being helped? And the crisis, like you said, can, I can't even imagine. So I wanted you to kind of share kind of your experience with the, we'll, we'll share like our personal experience on the hospital, like in the past, and then we'll come back to the present. But present. Okay. Um, I do want you to share about your experience with the Women and Children's Hospital because when I kind of noticed the building, it was, it was already in the present time and it was super abandoned. Yeah. But you actually spent some time there. So share I, with us what happened. I and did. I, I mean, you don't have to get into detail, but just as much as you're comfortable. Yeah, just for just for context. I mean, it, it's, it's who I am. What can I say? So I mentioned to you guys before, uh, probably a couple episodes back, episodes back that I have a disabled child um, during his disability he required surgery and while I live in what's considered the harbor area of Los Angeles so greater Los Angeles County most southern part I would say um, for whatever reason and back then I didn't know how to advocate the same way I do now the harbor area which is the most southern part of the greater Los Angeles I would say um, Back then, I did not know how to advocate for medically for my my child, my children. And for whatever reason, they shipped him to Women's and Children's Hospital in Boyle Heights. And this was in 2007, uh, the end of 2007, I think. I'm pretty sure. Anyway, at that time, I did not. I was a single parent of four kids, guys, and I didn't have a car. And my child my he would have been no more than four you guys are gonna make me do math right now and I'm not doing it but around three or four years old and um my other children wouldn't have been too much older than him no car all the way in Boyle Heights and I certainly didn't have money to go back and forth so I already I was in a pretty bad position where my disabled child is suffering and having to go through surgery and be there oftentimes alone for days or nearly a week at a time. I think he was there for six weeks or two months. So between six weeks and eight weeks. Children, Women's and Children's Hospital just was really dirty. At least it looked like it was filmed with filth just on the walls. The patients, um, it, it felt like... If any of you guys have ever been in a county um, like in the welfare office or GR office, which I guess I suppose I just, you know, told on my own self. It, it kind of felt like that when you go in there and um, just kind of hostile. There's a lot of security guards there, a lot of angry people, overcrowding. I wasn't really described of what was going on with him in layman's terms that I could understand. So there was a big question mark like on my face like I don't know what's going on with him he had a surgery but why is he still here for 
I just want to go home. Like, where, like, why can't we take my son home? And they explained it, but not in a way that I told him that totally made sense. So they kind of patronized me and it was, it was really rough. I remember a couple of times laying, they had chairs, the waiting room where it was basically for parents that were there for their children and the chairs made into like a reclining, reclining chair. And uh-huh. it was like where you could sleep. I remember one time in particular, there was some kind of huge emergency where they locked us all in the room because something was going on. I don't know if there was an open shooter. I don't think it was a shooter. Maybe someone had a gun on them or there was some kind of weapon involved. And we were stuck in there for hours, not knowing if our children were all right, what was going on. The ver- the first time I went to Women's and Children's Hospital, I walked through General Hospital because I didn't know where it was going. And it's huge it's like a maze i was so confused i didn't know where i was going and i'm already irritated i don't have a lot of good memories of that place being there as i was telling you earlier my a lot of it's fuzzy and dreamlike um i remember seeing security guards by the tunnels and i was thinking why is there tunnels like what's going on with the tunnel like it didn't make sense to me but i didn't stop and ask questions i just remember walking across the street to the jack in the box across from the coroner's office and sitting there and eating like a chicken sandwich, listening to my iPod, probably listening to like Green Day and just yeah. like, oh my God, my life, what is going on with my life? And being so sad because I didn't know what was going to happen with my son and and just stressed out about the whole thing. Because again, remember guys, I have three other young kids at home. So I can't stay there for days at a time and neglect the other three. So it was a really, really hard time in my life. And I didn't appreciate the architecture whatsoever back then, not even from the coroner's office. Right. Now when I, yeah, (laughs) yeah, it was directly across from it. And back then, you know, it's paranormal. And Oh, I guess I can mention that specifically for that time. It definitely holds a vibe. It definitely holds an energy, the whole area. It it kind of, it, it, you ever think of like a, a vehicle and you stop the car and you park and you get out and you look past the hood and you see like it looks kind of foggy or fuzzy and it's the like the steam radiating but you can't see it so it's it's like see-through but you could still tell that it's like that that's what the energy looks like coming off that place it's pretty crazy so the building again we're talking about is the woman and children's hospital it's a mid-century building so very very different from the art deco general hospital that we described earlier and the art deco hospital just as you mentioned there's a series of tunnels that go under the hospital which i think is amazing it's like an octopus <laughs> and these tunnels because the camp is so so big the tunnels lead to all the other hospitals which leads to the women and children's leads to the coroner's office and the parking lots Everywhere around the hospital, there's underground tunnels that that are used for pedestrians or like some of the work staff. Yeah, yeah, with like their little golf carts. Maybe originally they didn't have that, but it, it, I love that part about that hospital. But, but then well, keep- you know, again, the women and children's part was the mid-century building, which looked more modern. Well, can you imagine in the 1950s and the scare of communism and I think Hillhauser uh, mentioned the fact that one of those tunnels led to like a bomb shelter. So can you imagine having that there too? Like always in the back of your mind, living like that? I mean, if anything, my daughter, not to go too far off subject, my daughter was spazzing out last night because of the Chinese rocket. Can you imagine the Chinese rocket that had to come back to Earth in the atmosphere that a lot of people didn't even know about? But can you imagine being on high alert, like indoctrinated in you from school to have like a bomb like a bomb shelter and to always think in the back of your head like there's going to be a bombing that's crazy i don't know that's just it's it's a crazy thought to me like how would we live life like that yeah that is that is trippy and my experience with the hospital started i would say more about 2004 or 5 and it was because i went to visit a friend i mean i always seen it there and keep in mind, people, that this hospital has also been featured in many movies and shows. General Hospital. The General Hospital. 
Yeah, it was it, it featured the building in the intro during the 60s. So it's I don't know that it, it kind of became an icon in, in the television world, too. But um, I did go there to visit a friend in the er, yeah, about 2004 or five around there. And I just remember going to one of the side entrances down a long hallway, seeing these pictures of black and white pictures of the, the nurses in their scary uniforms. <laughs> no offense, nurses, but you know, none offense taken. Pictures in the hallways. I and I like she said, I I wasn't appreciating that history. I didn't look twice. I I did go up to an upper level floor. I think it was IC one of the ICUs, I believe, and. I, I kind of recall in my head how the waiting rooms looked and the hallways, but I really wish I would have taken photos. So that's why it's important to document these places because they might be gone one day. We might not get a chance to go back in. So that was my experience. And then later on, the Mission Street area where the coroner's office is and some of the other buildings, USC buildings, it was a very congested area for graffiti. There was a lot of graffiti action going there. There was a lot of, not at the hospital, but down the street, a lot of old trains and buildings. So I used to love going to that area a lot because of that. And then later on, me and you and Wayne went back. What made us go there? Was it the coroner's office or? It probably was initially the, the coroner's office. I did an internship and um, the new county um, building, the big old one, not, I say big old one, but it's really not that big in comparison to the general hospital, but the new one, I did an internship at um, L&D, labor and delivery there in nursing school. And what a difference, you know, state of the art technology and the little bridge from parking structure over there. And so I got to see general hospital like every day that was interesting. I didn't really think too much of it. Just I hated women. Like I, I hated women's and children's hospital. I'm like, I hate you every time I saw the building. I asked her, Ugh. did you walk around when you were doing the internship? And she was like, no. But no, because we went in. People were paying attention, you know? No, we went in there to work our job and work our asses off and, you know, deal with urine and all that other stuff in between, you know? And then come out, and then you're not thinking about anything except getting home, especially if you don't live anywhere near Boyle Heights, which I did not, and I still do not. So I'm just thinking, oh, my God, the traffic. What is it going to be like trying to get home? I wasn't thinking about the hospital whatsoever back then, except paranormally, which brings us right back to, like, why did we come there? Yeah. And then just to, uh, to tell the audience a, a little bit of the back to the timeline, the hospital um, closed about 2008, and during the Northridge earthquake in 1994, it did get damaged. Not where it, not where it, you know, fell down or anything, but yeah, both the women and childrens and the general hospital had some probably interior damage or whatnot. And it cost too much to fix these buildings, so it was more financially wise to rebuild a new hospital plus the technology part. They had to rebuild yes. something way more modern um, and smaller, too, because I guess the Art Deco building, it was by all means for everybody because it was so huge, the largest in the West Coast, probably till this day. But they had to scale it down a little bit as well because it was too large, which became probably too overwhelming and too much to be able to upkeep the yeah. population growing and whatnot. It, it became too much. Yeah. So it shut down in 2008, and then the new one opened up. So, I mean, it, they had been building it, obviously, through those um, earlier 2000s up until it opened in 2008. And the building stayed till this day. It's closed officially, but the first floor up into the fourth floor is still used by staff and administration. And then we'll talk about the women and children, what happened to that. But we did go there with Wayne, one of our friends. Did we Gladys go with us too? I can't remember. I remember. Well, and just in case you're listening, Gladys, you may have been there with us. So we're, <laughs> we're saying your name too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I hadn't been in. What do you remember about that trip? Because I went another time with my sister, my friend Tana, and her boyfriend, Lois, in the tunnels. But you we went just without kind of me. Stayed, 
around there. I've been in the tunnels too, but I don't think I was with you when I went in the tunnels. Right. Maybe, maybe not. I can't remember. That's what happens when you get old folks. Um, She's not old. (laughs) I'm not. I'm not old at all. I'm very young. Um, When uh, we went, it was probably in search of the paranormal. Oh, yeah. Uh, I do kind of remember. We went to the front part. But I think uh, maybe Gladys was there. Yeah, I'm pretty sure she was there with us. Yeah. But I think we went back with the corner's office separately. We did, because we went with our friend Steve that one time. Shout out to Steve. Hi, Steve. To the gift shop. (laughs) <laughs> well, that would have been like, oh, like five or six years ago when we went to the gift shop. But yeah. we probably, I remember us walking, we parked at a different angle or a strange area when we went with Wayne and Gladys and we walked down the majority of the pathway. We drove up to the front, to the top. Yeah, yeah. Which you can't do anymore because of COVID, but it was like just it was so lonely because they weren't using that part but the bottom level was used for like a there's another wellness center there yeah but we explored the front and the lobby part and then, and more yeah yeah we, didn't we yeah we didn't we get on that like middle layer like that middle <laughs> level maybe so, maybe not we don't know yeah my favorite part there was and i was telling her earlier to the left of that entrance, it's like a built-in like seating area. Because with our deco, there's a lot of wonderful built-ins, like yeah. really seating or fountains or things like that that are useful instead of like putting in a separate bench or whatever. At the time, it was better to kind of build it in. Um, I love that part. I think they had a garden section or something on the other side, which is newer, but on that built-in part, it was really nice. And I want to go back to see that part again but we'll see when and then we it's, did kind of go to the morgue sort of yeah we did <laughs> we did some things no, we didn't go in but just the outside of the morgue area yeah which had hand painted signs that said morticians parking or and not parking yeah <laughs> did we go up the wrong exit or in in the wrong way too yeah we did we explored quite a bit on foot i remember that time it was hot too it was probably like around this time of the year or later. Yeah, so it, it's a, a lot going on there. And I did go later maybe with my friend Tana, again, her boyfriend Lois, and my sister. I don't know why we went, but oh, I think she wanted to take photos too. And we actually got to go in the tunnel from the corner's office. And you're, you've seen that entrance, that tunnel entrance. Yeah, I've been in it before. I think yeah. probably with when I was do when I had my internship, we may have gone through there. But I've been there before for sure, for sure. Yeah, so we went through the tunnel, and there's like a series of like, like a cut. I don't know. It, it splits up in different ways, and one way is for pedestrians that are patients. I mean, like family or whoever. And then one way is for staff. I don't know. Somehow we got lost, sort of. And we went through an entrance that more, mostly staff went through, but it was still part of the tunnel. And we ended up in the gift shop. There's a gift shop down there in the tunnel basement. And it was still open and it was active. I thought that was so cool. And I feel like now it's probably going to be gone. And again, if we didn't take pictures, we didn't buy anything. I know. But there was a cool gift shop down there. And... We did go in and whatnot, and and then after that, it was the entrance to get out from the other side where we see, like, security going in there and now um, staff and whatnot. But this was, again, pre-COVID, so it's it's open to the public. I mean, it's a public taxpayer-paid hospital, so it's not completely, like, it's not private at all. It's it's part of the public that we could go to, you know, it's an open space. Again, of course, you have to have security in hospitals for the most part, but it was really cool to explore that. And and at the time, I was, I was, we were interested in the architecture and building, but it just wasn't probably as much as now. Yeah, it was. It's so funny, full circle moment, right? Like, as long as we've known each other, we've been exploring urban or otherwise or rural because we were in a lot of rural places, and even then we were exploring and 
I think I was more in the quest for paranormal and such. And you were just appreciative of the building, more or less. Mm-hmm. And um, now look at, we just didn't even know what we were looking for. And it was right in front of our face. Yeah. Well, we started going back more when COVID started because there was more time to like explore the city with not a million people being around, which yes. was a pro. A con a was pro. that everything was closed off. Yeah. But just to give you context of the area, I mean, you have Lincoln Park there across the street, which was built in the late 1800s. You have Central Juvenile Hall, like literally across the street, built in 1912. Again, the coroner's office in the early 1900s. And then you have all uh, the the mid-century buildings that were built. And then now there's like newer buildings. I think they have the Hyatt Hotel and new student dorms because it's actually the USC campus for for students, the USC Health and Science Campus. So it's actually like a college campus mixed in with a public area. It's very odd. It's not like when you go to USC in downtown. Yeah. Yeah. Very different. So, you know, for me, I like the how the building is just very powerful. It makes a statement. It's above us, in a sense. It's strong still. It's mysterious. It has so many crevices, so many details, a million windows. Windows. <laughs> and... It just, you know, in combination with all the history is the area, just makes it very interesting to me, at least. So what do you, what do you feel when you go there? As I was trying to um, articulate earlier that it's so massive and the people who uh, built it really kept uh, no detail out, as you can see when you walk in and it's got the famous scholars um, from science and the angel of death and these are icons they put these icons up so we know that this building is there to help us to save us to um uphold medical integrity and and cure this the sick and it's no longer in use but those icons have no less strength and power in them and we can only imagine how many people they saw daily, how many people they still see to this day. And that hospital, it only grows. And I think during this podcast, or at least for me, not this episode particularly, but um, beyond the facade for me is recognizing that buildings, some buildings and um, some facades, uh, they hold a soul behind it. Mm-hmm these icons have really given this hospital its power and yeah it's not something you want to um fight against or mess with and thank goodness it's a historical site so we'll never have to worry about it being torn down but um it's 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 massive and i wouldn't want to be on the receiving end of its negative feelings and yes i'm talking about the hospital yeah and i agree totally with like the the way you describe the feelings of it it has a some kind of presence i mean i I, i'm not sensitive to paranormal or much of that but even um like just looking at it and and how it sits and thinking about the people that i was reading on the articles so many people were born there so many people died there there's so much going on there, so much. At one time there was. Yeah. Can you imagine all those echoes of all those deaths and all those births culminated in one building? Can you imagine what that would sound like if it was screamed out loud? It'd be pretty yeah. freaking intense. I believe too, one of my coworkers that was working at the hospital as a psychologist said that there was one of the floors that they told her, oh, be beware that you might see one of these kids. He he's always comes 
to the floor you you see him he's cool like don't mind the kid or it's some kind of child <laughs> um that would appear and she was freaking out but like i guess people are so used to it that work there it's it obviously is his word of mouth but yeah i can't i can't only imagine this kid and who else right but maybe there's some that have been stayed there for some reason longer than what we think definitely i mean even in and anywhere, anywhere you have a death, you have a potential of a lingering spirit. And I think that it's amplified when you have it in a place, when we're talking about hospitals. I've investigated many hospitals throughout the years, and um, they're definitely one of the, you know, hotbeds for paranormal activity because you have so much energy in there, whether if it's the, the last drop of energy before death or if it's the very beginning of energy when it's you know born or the pain or the happiness or the healing it, it all leaves an imprint rather if it's conscious or subconscious or unconscious you know that's you know you could speculate on that but nonetheless you can't change the fact that much energy has been spent at a hospital especially that one with all those patients and early Angelinos. Yeah, definitely. And there, I mean, so many people have gone there. There's been, there was like a million articles on different things on there. But so it, it has a ton of stories that, I mean, we can't even probably put all together in this podcast. But when, when I started uh, posting about it, just like from the, whenever I did, there, mm. I, I did kind of interact with other like urban explorers that were very interested in the hospital more for the urban exploring yeah concept and or have actually explored in there especially the women and children's hospital because we kind of got to see the demise of the building right (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> I wish I could say that I wasn't happy about it, but I remember we were there. We were there not too long ago and we saw the building. It was like a half a building. Yeah. And I didn't feel any kind of emotion, no sadness, no happiness, just indifference because that place for me brings back a very sad, sad yeah. part in my life or a hard part in my life. Right. And for me, I've seen it like with the architectural perspective, like when we did go in 2010, we would be, we passed by it, I think a few times and never took pictures. So kind of, I wish I did again, but I did get to see a bunch of different urban explorers, like videos of people, you know, going and doing their thing. And it was really Uh interesting. Um, Didn't we park somewhere near it and like walk up the steps from there to General Hospital? Something like that. I yeah, mean, I remember something vaguely like that. Oh my gosh, it's like a dream. Yeah. So there was a lot of people interested. There's a couple of accounts. There's um I'll shut them out. OJ Romero and he runs a page LAC USC Women and Children's Hospital. He really um, enjoyed the architecture of the building and you know been uh, urban exploring of of the building and the area of. USC and the women children so he documented kind of a lot of the ending to the hospital and in some of the beginnings and uh, some of the explorations inside which I thought was interesting I seen well AJ if you're listening to this hit us up and let us know if you had any paranormal experiences I would love to know (laughs) well I did ask uh, for there is another account he goes by sweaty Brandon (laughs) <laughs> and the, <laughs> and a, a urban photographer explorer too and he it's on his page showed the inside of the amphitheater which looks freaking amazing in the photography Ooh. i did ask him about the paranormal and he said nothing there i mean at least not in the, that building that what his experience that day so yeah i mean again it maybe could be based on time and who the person of course going in there so, yeah, so a lot of people that are in the urban exploring world seem to enjoy some of these buildings, too, to document, you know, some of their adventures. So, you know, everybody has kind of a different reason to like the area and the building and whether it's the architecture, the lost and abandoned 
you know, aspect of it. So I thought that was cool. And as far as the other buildings, I know we, we went across the street the other, I guess like a month ago now to the... Was it a uh, month ago? I thought it was like a couple of months. Time is flying. The laboratory. Yeah, it was probably longer than we we had gone a few times this past year. Twenty. Yeah. <laughs> Are you but, kidding? That's a beacon for her. She goes back wherever we go out. That's where we stop. Yeah. We always do. And it's just, I guess, because it's well during the <laughs> the weekend, it's lonely. So I kind of like that. Yeah. But I know during the week, it is a a place for many people work. So yeah. It's to them. It's probably like, oh, we're going to work, but yeah. So that that building across is another mid-century building, and they did lab work there. There's just all kinds of different buildings connected to USC that are still there or abandoned or you know actively still working. But again, like I said earlier, now there's a hotel that went up, so it's kind of getting a little bit. I don't know. Want to say gentrified because it's not like. Um, homes there or anything like that but it is a hotel and there is more student housing um, USC that's the land that they kind of own the land mm -hmm. it, most of it so they're developing a lot of the land and updating all these buildings I mean they have a lot of money so I'm sure along with the county they're there they have the money to upgrade a lot of these, these buildings yeah but I was reading that as far as the future of the hospital, <clears throat> like it's just sitting there and when something sits there for too long and it doesn't get preserved, it might kind of decay. I did read an article where the, one of the council members was looking at, looking at it to have some uh, adaptive reuse for like either homelessness, some kind of low income type of housing situation or some kind of more, use it for something for the community because it might just decay if it just if they don't keep up with it like at least maintain a little bit so it won't rot yeah it makes sense especially if this you know this hospital was dedicated to you know everyone paying or unable to pay it would really be you know pay homage to its ori original use by allowing homeless people to come in and have a place to stay because we have a major problem with homelessness in yeah, this country, but in around. Los Angeles, it's, it's just, it's horrible. I mean, just all around the area, um, Lincoln Park, there's a lot of people there. It's, it's all over. And they are looking yeah. to scrambling to house everybody. And there are buildings like this that are kind of just sitting there. But yeah. it is a bureaucracy of trying to figure out how to reuse them, the funding and like whether also the community wants it in there and it's just all kinds of politics that come along with that but yeah I course. hope they do do something with it I mean I know that if they don't it might just again decay and we or the in we don't want that like I know they can't no. tear it down but still like we don't want it just to become worse I'm still waiting you know waiting quietly in the shadows for them to open the doors one day so I can go in there and do some investigating my own self. That would be great. And right now it is still working in the front. They were doing COVID testing and mm -hmm. they were giving COVID vaccines. And I do follow the hospital on Instagram, which it's kind of, you know, they have a lot of the updates of what they're doing. And it's still the, the building, at least the front stair part is actively working and so you can't really roam around kind of like before but mm -mm. i mean maybe in the future i mean they'll... yes and go to that pool yeah i really want oh, to go see that, pool. that tell us about that oh. it's a pool it was a pool i don't remember what floor it's on so forgive me folks i forgot but it was a pool specifically for um like physical therapy and obviously it's empty it has no water in it but just because of my past experiences, like at Queen Mary with empty pools, I kind of have, have like, I don't want to say an affinity, but I'll be drawn to the pool. And I really want to go see the pool. Yeah. And just among the other fact, things. Yeah. And just the fact that they use a the roof for many things. Yes. And putting patients in the sun. Yes. <laughs> I mean, that's an ingenious way, I suppose, to get, you know, vitamin C. Um, but. Or D. 
<sighs> and I, vitamin D. Um, <laughs> but uh, I just feel like it's a recipe for disaster. What, the pool? No, the roof. Oh. I guess it's just because I, you know, I fall so easy. And just like tripping over my own feet, I can't even imagine being like having the temptation. Over. I imagine them like laying on the bed, kind of with the with the nurse next to them, and then they enjoy the sun and they get pushed back. I don't know. I don't know. Well, the nurses said that they were like, um, I don't know. They had the room, the ward for for their patients. Like that's a lot of patients for one nurse. So a lot of things happen yeah who knows how that was structured during that time but yeah it has all those layers as, as if you if you look at it it has like different levels and like the way it's designed it has different levels and the even the top roof part with that huge window all that top roof of that top floor was the surgical units because remember what yeah. i learned in the hill Helzer episode was for the sunlight to come in so they could get better lighting during surgery yeah so that was really you know smart to kind of think that way back then it, you know it really was because they didn't have the technology that we do now and yeah can you imagine how pretty that would look yeah so why cutting open the body <laughs> so what while cutting open the body oh yeah <laughs> and students watching yeah but if you or listening and you do it, you know, there should be a tour of the air of the inside. Yeah, it would be a great to way to, um, to make money. Yeah, maybe to raise money for using doing something with the hospital, or some Honestly. kind of funding for like the patient care or the wellness center. That would be a good way to raise money. Because I'm sure a lot yeah. of people would want to see it. I probably know 20 easy who would go in there in a heartbeat. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So uh, any last comments of the hospital before we wrap it up? No, I appreciate its grandeur. And um, I imagine that it will be here long after I'm gone. And long after my children are gone and God forbid the day I have grandchildren after <laughs> they're gone. Um, so no, I just have a respect for it. I just wish I would have had the forethought to go and speak to spooks when I had an opportunity to. And I'm glad the women and children's hospital is gone. I said it. <laughs> yeah. I think for me, Keep an eye out. I, I am doing a research on Central Juvenile Hall. There's two parts already on some of the history of that, which is again across the street. Central is used. Does they take? They used to take their the kids to the hospital if needed. The LA County Jail used to take, you know, inmates to the hospital as needed if they needed more hospital care. They still take them to the new LA County Jail. I mean, new LA County um, Hospital. But they, so it's connected in many ways to other buildings in that area. So I'll be still wrapping it up on Central Juvenile Hall. Right now, um, I'm up, up until the 1940s, and then I'm doing a timeline of it up until present day. And I did do some history on Lincoln Park, which is also right there connected to the hospital. Well, you know, walking distance away. And... I know Sabrina loves uh, handball carts at Hather Park. <laughs> you told them my secret. Yeah, she likes playing handball. It goes back to my, you know, um, obsession with the uh, movies that we saw in the 90s. <laughs> and we'll just leave it there. Yeah. And then, so yeah, we'll, we'll still be going just to, there's never enough and never ends. And Honestly, it's a full circle. I keep this last week has been pretty manic for me with homework and other things going on. But if you knew what we knew and you don't know what we know yet, there everything just leads back to the same places and the same locations when we're talking uh -huh. about early Los Angeles. And it's not it's that's like the epicenter of what was happening back then. So you will hear it again. It will be coming back up again. Yeah. So stay tuned. Um, we do have a 
another interview coming up. Yes, um, I'm looking week. very forward to that. Yeah, and Hood Historian was so much fun, yeah, and uh, oh, so I can't wait for the next one. Yeah, and then another uh, episode coming up after that. So there's a lot going on that we'll we'll be bringing to you guys. So if you want to follow me, I am Zona Junta under Swami underscore Chronicles. You can follow the podcast page too on Beyond the Facade Podcast, and you want to share your info. Um, you can follow me at observing underscore spooks underscore and other vices. It's a, it's not a dead page. It's just, I haven't had a lot of time to dedicate, um, and really set up stuff. So I'm still there, even though, you know, it, it looks like it's a ghost town. It's really not. I'm busy visiting ghost towns. That's the problem. Oh yeah, we want to see that on your page. And this is episode six, by the way. So we're we're up there. We're trying to Yeah, you know, get more content out for you. And again, this is all stuff that we're interested in for one reason or another, whether we're connected to it in some way, whether like whether it's she explored it paranormal wise or it's just something we really enjoy looking at architecture wise. The present It's personal to us. Yeah. So and we're inviting mostly, you in. Yes. Most of these places we share because we care about them. We have a connection or we're just really interested in learning more about them. So definitely continue, you know, listening and we'll, you know, keep this, have these discussions. Um, if you have any feedback on anything, leave comments on, on our Beyond the Star podcast or any of that, you know, we'll, we'll Follow us, interact with us. We're pretty good at answering back. And um, yeah, we look forward to hearing from you and sharing with you. Grab your teacup and saucer and get ready for the next episode. All righty. Bye, everybody. Bye.